What is going on, wonderful people? It's Medicosis Perfectionaires, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my statistics playlist. In previous videos, we talked about the measure of central tendency, the mean, the median, and the mode. We talked about the range, bimodal distributions, sensitivity versus specificity, positive and negative predictive values, positive and negative likelihood ratios, incidence versus prevalence, the different study designs such as case series, case control study, cross-sectional study, cohort study, both prospective cohort and retrospective cohort. We also talked about twin concordance studies, adoption studies, and ecological studies. Today, we'll talk about the concept of the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis, the odds ratio, the confidence interval, and even the p-value. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. This is my statistics playlist, don't forget to watch these videos. This video was made possible thanks to a generous donation from Dr. Fahd, so please take a moment to say thank you to this doctor in the comments. I recommend that you watch the previous video, study design, before this one, because we're going to use the concepts of odds ratio today, which is related to case control studies, which start in the present but look backwards onto the past. Warren Buffett said, rule number one in investing, don't lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one. By the same token, the first rule of statistics is that correlation is not the same as causation. And the second rule of statistics, please refer to rule number one. If you want to see more videos like this in the future, drop your favorite math symbol in the comments. The first topic that we'll talk about today is the null hypothesis. Null means nothing. It means no. It means that there is no correlation between X and Y. So let's say that you are conducting a study trying to figure out whether or not X can lead to Y. For example, can cigarette smoking cause lung cancer? Yes or no. This is the plan. This is what the study is going to be about. So what will the null hypothesis say? Null means no. The null hypothesis will say that there is no correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. Then you start the study. The study has shown that cigarette smoking is correlated with lung cancer. So now we have rejected the null hypothesis. We rejected the claim that there is no correlation between smoking and lung cancer. Be careful. We can never accept the null hypothesis. You either reject it or you fail to reject it. But there is no such thing as accepting the null hypothesis. Stop it. Get some help. Example number one. We're trying to find out whether there is a correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. What will the null hypothesis claim? It will claim that there is no correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer because it's called the null hypothesis. No. Then we conduct the study. We find out that there is a correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And then voila, we have successfully rejected the null hypothesis. Here is another example for you. We're trying to find out whether there is a correlation between the shoe size and educational achievement in a given population. What will the null hypothesis say? The null hypothesis will claim that there is no correlation between the shoe size and the educational achievement. Let's conduct our study. We found out that there is no correlation between the shoe size and educational achievement, which means that the null hypothesis was true. And we have failed to reject the null hypothesis. That was the null hypothesis. But how about the alternative hypothesis? Here's an example to help you understand the alternative hypothesis. Let's suppose that we are trying to find out whether there is a correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. The null hypothesis assumes that there is no correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, whereas the alternative hypothesis assumes that there is some correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And this is why the null hypothesis is abbreviated H sub zero, null hypothesis, whereas the alternative hypothesis, which assumes a correlation exists, is abbreviated H sub one. Understanding this table is of utmost importance. It's a two by two table. We have two horizontal rows and two vertical rows. In the first horizontal row, we are rejecting the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis said that there is no correlation, but we have rejected the null hypothesis because we were able to show that there is indeed a correlation. 
In the second horizontal row, however, we have failed to reject the null hypothesis, which means that the null hypothesis was accurate. Indeed, there is no correlation between x and y. Then in the first column, we will have the alternative hypothesis, and in the second one, we have the null hypothesis. No correlation between x and y. There is a correlation between x and y. There is a correlation between x and y, and yes, there is a correlation between x and y, that's why I rejected the null hypothesis. Oh, so we're matching. So, we are matching reality. This is statistical power, and statistical power is measured as 1 minus beta. So, let's write this down. Power equals 1 minus beta, and therefore we can bring beta to the opposite side. It's going to look like this. Power plus beta equals 1. Anytime we have two entities added to one another and they equal a constant, these two entities are inversely correlated with one another. Meaning, if the beta error decreases, statistical power increases, and vice versa. If the beta error increases, statistical power decreases. Statistical power is a good thing. Beta error is a bad thing. And that's why one is up, the other is down. Statistical power is up. Beta error is down. Why did I make an error? Well, when I did this study, I failed to reject the null hypothesis, which means I assumed that the null hypothesis is correct, which means uh, there is no correlation between X and Y. I concluded that there is no correlation between smoking and lung cancer. But reality said otherwise. In reality, there is a correlation between smoking and lung cancer, making this an error. What kind of error? It's a false negative error. It's a type 2 error. It is a beta error. Why is it false negative? First, I'm going to explain why it is negative, and then I'm going to explain why it is false. Negative because I said, you know what, there is no correlation between smoking and lung cancer. That's the negative. Okay, is that true? It is not true. It is false because it's not matching with reality. I assume that there is no correlation between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, but in reality, there is a correlation between smoking and lung cancer, i.e., I was blind to the evidence. I was blindsided by my incompetence. This is a type 2 error. The probability of making a type 2 error is called the beta. Okay, cool. How about here? Well, let's see what's happening here. I did the study, okay? I was able to reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis says that there is no correlation between the shoe size and the educational achievement. I was able to reject the null hypothesis, meaning that I assume that there is a correlation between shoe size and educational achievement. But reality said otherwise. Reality said there is no correlation whatsoever between the shoe size and your educational achievement. So you are guilty of an error. It was a type 1 error. And the probability of making type 1 error is called the alpha. This is a false positive. Let me explain why it is positive. Then I'll explain why it is false. Why is it positive? Because I was making a positive claim. I claim that there is a correlation between the shoe size and educational achievement. But reality said, nah, -uh, not true. So that was a false conclusion. I was guilty of type 1 error. I made up evidence that was not there in reality. I just made it up. I said that your shoe size can predict your educational achievement, but this is absolutely made up. In other words, I totally pulled it out of my... You get the point. Statistical power is when your study agrees with reality. Type 1 error is when you make up stuff. Type 2 error is when you're blind to the evidence. In type 1 error, you did reject the null hypothesis, but you shouldn't have rejected the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis was true. In type 2 error, you did not reject the null hypothesis, but you should have rejected the null hypothesis because the null hypothesis was not true. I.e. there was indeed a correlation between smoking and lung cancer. Please, get a sheet of paper and draw everything on this slide on your paper many times. Otherwise, you're guaranteed to forget about this on your exam. If you wish to download these doozy colorful notes, go to medicosisperfectionalis.com. I help you learn, understand, and pass exams. If you want me to personally tutor you, reach out to me on my website. We're done with the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis. Now let's turn our attention to the odds ratio. 
In my last statistics video, we talked about the study design. Different types of study include cross-sectional study, case control study, and cohort study. Recall that all of these are observational studies and not interventional studies. Cross-sectional studies are concerned with the present and the present only. Hey, do you have type 1 diabetes? Yes or no? Hey, do you have Hashimoto thyroiditis? Yes or no? I'm asking about the present only. This is called cross-sectional study to see whether or not there is a correlation between Hashimoto thyroiditis and type 1 diabetes. This helps us find risk factors and prevalence. For example, I am obese, okay, and also my LDL is too high. So that's a correlation. That's a risk factor. But again, remember that correlation is not the same as causation. How about case control studies? Well, we are living in the present. But I'm gonna ask you about your past. You don't really want to know about my past, do you? Do you want a cookie or something? Let me do some talking. Case control study, I'm asking you right now. Do you have lung cancer today? Oh yeah, I do have lung cancer. Okay, have you smoked in the past? Oh yeah. Or do you have mesothelioma today? Yes, I do. Were you exposed to asbestos in the past? Yes or no? This is called a case control study. Why do we do it? To find out the odds ratio. Does exposure to asbestos increase the odds of me developing mesothelioma? Yes or no? This is called the odds ratio. Why do we call it a ratio? Well, guess what? It is a ratio. It has a numerator and a denominator. Duh! Because on the exam, when the student gets asked about the odds ratio, some of them will start to subtract and add and do anything in math except divide. Honestly, people need to get their heads out of their collective sphincter. It is called the ratio. However, cohort studies, well, we live in the present, but I'm gonna follow up with you to see your future. You're smoking cigarettes right now. Let's see whether or not you will develop lung cancer in the future. This is a prospective cohort study. Why do we do it? To find out about the relative risk. Again, if it's called relative, it implies division with a numerator and a denominator. If you want me to make a video on relative risk, please comment below. In order to calculate the odds ratio, you need to always create a 2 by 2 table. On top, you're going to write about the disease. Okay, disease or outcome. Whatever the outcome might be. It might be a negative outcome as a disease or a positive outcome, meaning no disease or less disease. And on this axis, you're going to write exposure. It could be exposure to something negative, as in exposure to smoking, or exposure to something protective or positive such as inoculation. Then you're going to divide your table like this. Positive means disease exists. Negative means no disease. It is the negative with regards to statistics, not with regards to your feelings. Because if I have no disease, I will indeed be very positive. But that's not statistics. Positive or negative when it comes to the presence or absence of the disease. Exposure. If I were exposed to cigarettes, that's the positive. Not exposed to cigarettes, that's a negative. Disease is present. Disease is absent. Exposure is present. Exposure is absent. You have to organize your table exactly as I said. If you flip this or flip this, you will get everything wrong. And you have to write A here, B here. B has to be here, not here. Don't say A, B. No, uh, A, B, and then C, D. Just like that. So let's suppose that this is exposure to cigarettes and this disease is lung cancer. This quadrant represents people who were exposed to smoking and who developed lung cancer. Here, these people smoked but did not develop lung cancer. These people did not smoke but they did develop lung cancer. These people neither smoked nor developed lung cancer because it's negative here and negative here. So your table should always look like this. Pause and review. Practice makes perfect. Disease is present, disease is absent. Exposure or intervention present, exposure or intervention is negative. To find the odds ratio, you divide A over C, okay, all divided by B over D. So the numerator has people who are sick, whereas the denominator contains people who are not sick. A and B are exposed, C and D were not exposed. And then we remember from basic mathematics that the denominator of the denominator is a numerator, 
so the D can go upstairs next to the A. And the denominator of the numerator is a denominator, so you can shift the C downstairs with the B. So now it's AD over BC. And if you are a historian, this reminds you of what? Oh, Anno Domini over before Christ. The modern days over the old days. You have to start with modern days first and then the old days. It is AD over BC, not BC over AD. Now let's practice. I want you to pause the video and try to construct the table yourself. Now pause. Okay, let's go. What should I do first? You write disease here. Okay. On the left, disease is present. On the right, disease is absent. Yes, these people have a disease. These people do not have that disease. And on the other axis, you're going to write exposure. The positive is always up. The negative is always down. People who were exposed to smoking and did have the disease COPD are 40 persons, right? 40 here. Smoked but did not develop COPD, 10 persons. You put 10 here. Did not smoke but had COPD, 20 persons, right? 20 here. And no smoking, no COPD, 20 persons, put the 20 here. Don't forget, this is A, this is B, this is C, this is D. If you want the odds ratio, it is AD over BC. Look at this. AD over BC. AD over BC. AD, that's 40 times 20. Let's write that here. And BC is 10 times 20. Let's draw this here. Amazing. Cancel the 20 with the 20. 40 divided by 10 is 4. The odds ratio equals 4. What does that even mean? It means that COPD patients are four times more likely to have history of smoking. These are the odds. See, statistics makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Crunch your numbers and get your answer. AD over BC equals four, meaning COPD patients are four times more likely to have a history of smoking. And that was the story of the odds ratio the reason behind performing case control studies. In our example here, the odds ratio was 4. Is this a positive number? Yeah, it is positive 4 and it's greater than 1, which means that the odds of exposure are greater in patients with COPD. There you go. How about another example? Suppose that the odds ratio was 1 over 2 or 0 0.5. That will mean that the odds of exposure are lower in the patients compared to the control group. And if the odds ratio equals 1, it means there is no difference between the patients who are sick and the people who are not sick. They have the same odds. Next topic is the confidence interval. The confidence interval definition. It is the interval. No kidding. Which is expected to typically contain the parameter being estimated. Example, when I say 95% confidence interval, I mean 95% of the population or the populations, and they hover around the mean. And if it's 95%, it means what? It means that there is 5% missing, because 1 or 100% minus 95% will give me 5%. And because this is a normal distribution curve, the 5% will be divided into two equal halves, one on the right, one on the left. Two and a half percent here and two and a half percent there. These are excluded from the 95% confidence interval. 95% confidence interval means that 95% of sample means are in this range. So this is the mean of the first study. This is the mean of the second study, the mean of the third study, the mean of the fourth study, the mean of the fifth study, etc. Add them up together, 95% of the sample mean are within this range. That's what the confidence interval mean. No pun intended. The larger the sample size, the narrower the confidence interval. That's why we say that there is statistical power in numbers. The greater the sample size, the better. Within limits, of course. Conversely, the greater the variability between the means. One mean is here, the other mean was here, the third mean was here. That's weird. This will give you a wider confidence interval because I am not that confident when the means are all over the place. 95% confidence interval means that I will exclude the population mean 5% of the time. 
two and a half percent here and two and a half percent there and this is how you get the two and a half percent two and a half and two and a half is five percent where did you get the five percent from confidence interval equals one minus the alpha the alpha is the probability of committing a type one error if the alpha is set at five percent one minus five percent is 95 percent or you can say that one minus the confidence interval equals the alpha you will hear about 95% confidence interval, which will exclude the population mean 5% of the time. You will also hear of 99% confidence interval, which will exclude the population mean only 1% of the time. But you will never, ever, ever hear of 100% confidence interval because this is ridiculous. The 100% confidence interval has to include every single possibility on Earth, which will range from negative infinity to positive infinity. You will run out of paper and you will run out of Excel spreadsheet. Again, the confidence interval plus the alpha have to add up to 1 or 100%. Some pearls for the pros. If the 95% confidence interval for mean difference excludes the zero, then we can reject the null hypothesis, which means the results are statistically significant. Just because they are statistically significant doesn't necessarily mean that they are clinically significant, which is something that most dietitians do not get. Well, actually, studies have shown that rubbing some eucalyptus under your smelly axilla is going to reduce your LDL level in the plasma by 0.001%. Who the hell cares? This is not clinically significant. Don't waste my time. But it took me 17 years to run this research. You can take your study and rub it under your axilla. Medicosis woke up and chose violence. Just joking. Back to the topic. To belabor the point because it's worth belaboring, let's suppose that we are trying to establish whether there is a difference between the mean of this population and the mean of that population. What should we do? You look at the mean difference. Let's say that the mean difference is from 0 0.2 until 0 0.9 and they said that this is my 95% confidence interval for the mean differences. Ask yourself the following question. Does this interval include zero? The answer is no, it does not include zero. This is higher than zero. So we excluded the zero, meaning we have rejected the null hypothesis, meaning the results are statistically significant. And yes, indeed, there is correlation between X and Y. But if you're doing confidence interval for the odds ratio or the relative risk, you got to ask yourself whether or not we exclude the one. Let me give you an example. Suppose that the 95% confidence interval for the odds ratio of COPD and exposure to smoking was between 1.3 and 2.1. Ask yourself, does this include the 1? No, it does not include the 1. This is higher than 1. If it excludes the 1, you reject the null hypothesis and the results are statistically significant. And yes, indeed, people with COPD are more likely to have been exposed to smoking. What if the confidence interval for the odds ratio was, let's say, negative 3.2 until negative 1.2? Does that include the 1? No, it excludes the 1. So we reject the null hypothesis, and the results are statistically significant, and this means what? Negative correlation, meaning people with COPD are less likely to have smoked in the past. More likely, positive. Less likely, negative. What if the odds ratio did not exclude the one? For example, it was from 0 0.5 to 1.5. This includes the one, meaning cannot reject the null hypothesis, meaning not statistically significant. For relative risk, it's the exact same concept. Ask yourself whether the interval includes the one or excludes the one. If it includes the one, not statistically significant, I cannot reject the null hypothesis. If it excludes the one, statistically significant, and I can reject the null hypothesis. If the interval is greater than one, there is a greater risk. But if the interval is less than one, it is less risk compared to the control group. If the confidence interval between two groups does not overlap, for example, here is one and here's the other. Oh, they do not overlap. This is perfect. This is statistically significant. For example, these are the people who did smoke and these are the people who did not smoke. You'll find that the people who did smoke had the cancer 
and the people who did not smoke did not have the cancer. And they are separated from one another. This is statistically significant. And you can go ahead and reject that null hypothesis and throw it away into the dustbin of statistical history. Our final topic today is the p-value. To say that the average doctor sucks at statistics is the understatement of the millennium. Some doctors assume that as long as my p-value is less than 0.05, therefore, my research findings are the truth, the whole truth, and nothing by the truth. This is just a load of bilge water. It tells me that you have no idea what you're talking about and you have no idea what the p-value means. So what does the p-value even mean? Well, let me draw the normal distribution curve, also known as the bell-shaped curve or the Gaussian curve. Since the big hump is around the middle, this is more likely to be observed because it's near the mean. However, on the extremes, these two are less likely to be observed because they are extremes. Extreme on the left or extreme on the right. Okay, and now what? Let's say that we're going to use the same value for the alpha, which is 5%. Remember when we said that confidence interval plus the alpha equals 1? Oh yeah, and if the confidence interval is 95%, then the alpha will be 5%. Oh yeah, and the 5% is divided into 2.5% here and 2.5% there. Let me shade the 2.5% on the right. Okay, this is just perfect. And let me shade the 5% on the left. Amazing. Okay, so now what? Remember that alpha is an error. It's a type 1 error. It's the probability of committing the type 1 error. And you want the error to be as low as possible. Hopefully, less than 5%, i.e. less than 0.05. And this is usually the p-value that is used in medicine. What this tells you is that the probability of an observed or more extreme result, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, is less than 5%. Which means that your research result is more likely than not in the ballpark, in the area that you wanted, and that your findings are not super extreme. That's what the p-value means. It does not mean that your conclusions are correct. It does not mean that you're going to get a Nobel Prize. And it does not mean that we should let your gluteus maximus dictate public policy. By the way, a p-value less than 0.05 is not itch in stone. You can simply change it. How about being more rigorous and aiming for an alpha, which is the probability of committing type 1 error or false positive error, is less than 1%. I want my error to be less than 1%. Amazing, which means the p-value should be less than 0.01. You can definitely do a study and aim for a p-value less than 0.01. Hopefully, this is a more rigorous approach. But of course, as Dr. Thomas Sowell said, there are no solutions in life, only trade-offs. This is gonna make it harder on you to find anything that is statistically significant, let alone clinically significant. We reject the null hypothesis when the value is significantly higher than the mean, or if the value is significantly lower than the mean. How do I know that my results are not super extreme? It's when your p-value is less than 0.05. When your p-value is low, you can tell the null to go to hell. When the p-value is low, tell the null to go to hell. We rejected the null hypothesis, which means our findings are statistically significant. A p-value that is less than 5% means that the probability of repeated tests giving results that extreme by chance alone is less than 5%. So how can we define the p-value? It's the probability of obtaining test results as extreme as those observed during the test, assuming that your null hypothesis is true and there is no correlation between x and y. Once you run the study, once you obtain your findings with a p-value that is less than 5%, go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. Please note that p-value is the probability of the data if the null hypothesis is true, and not the other way around. P-value is not the probability of the null given the data that we got. Let me say it again. P-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true. P-values do not measure the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. Scientific conclusions should not be based only on whether the p-value is lower than a specific threshold. 
even if your p-value is low, this doesn't necessarily mean that your effect size is high or that your conclusions are very important. On its own, the p-value does not give us a good measure of evidence regarding a model or a certain hypothesis. The p-value only means this. And when it passes a certain threshold, you can reject the null hypothesis and that your findings are more likely to be statistically significant than not. That is it. Please don't forget to say thank you to this kind gentleman in the comments. Take a look at my statistics playlist. I have several videos. If you value what I do, help me make more videos by supporting the channel. Go to buymeacoffee.com slash medicosis. There are more than 600 premium videos available on this channel when you click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, smash like, support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you would like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.